Um, so to give a bit of context to this work first, this is, um, this is about doing data science, statistics, or machine learning for problems that are relevant to cybersecurity. So there's a number of people here who should be acknowledged, uh, in, including sort of collaborators, Nick and Nal, a um, bunch of people in the industry, and, and maybe um, also the Hilburn Institute for Mathematical Research, who fund my fellowship at Oxford. And here, what the, the main aim is, is to apply these methods to problems affecting UK national security. So <coughs> even if some of the things I'm, I'm going to say might sound a little bit theoretical, there are real serious aims to try to make this work, um, to protect against hostile actors. Um, so this is an example of cybersecurity data. So what you're looking at here is... Um, so is that the microphone or am I connect? Oh, I'm fine. Um, Los Alamos National Lab have, uh, well, are famous for having invented uh, the first nuclear weapons and therefore have very serious cybersecurity concerns. And they've actually recently released public data about their network and their computer traffic in the hope that it will somehow um, help statistical researchers develop methods for this problem. So what you're looking at here is a graph, obviously. Uh, don't worry about the colors for now. And it's just one minute. And so, OK, so the, so the circles, the nodes, are computers. And the links just indicate that the computers have communicated in the one minute I'm looking at them. So as you zoom in a little bit, um, you sort of realize that this graph idea is a little bit of an illusion because obviously between pairs of, um, pairs of communicating computers, there's actually much more of a stochastic process going on. It's not really like a fixed actual edge. Um, so I've tried to represent that basically by these sort of timelines where you see, um, uh, well, a point process basically, so a sequence of event times. Um, and on top of that, for each event, there is additional information like the volume of data that's been transferred, um, things like the port, which indicate the sort of behavior that's going on. So port 80 is, um, indicates web. And I've, so I've tried to represent that as uh, colors for categorical information and size for sort of continuous information. I don't know if it works. Zooming in again. So we've changed network. We're on Imperial College. It's uh, my colleague Nick Herod, who's sort of being recorded right now. Um, what I've done is, uh, so on the x-axis, you've got um, time. And on the y-axis, I've just split the data up by the servers and ports where they're being used. So there's no relevance to the order of things on the y-axis. It's just split by different um, servers. And the only point about this picture is that I think most of you here probably have no idea what's going on when you see that. But actually, having worked in the field for a bit now, I can, I can look at it almost like, you know, in the matrix or something, and I can, I can tell you what's going on, right? Um, so in uh, so one minute in, for example, Nick is browsing the web uh, on port 443, and then adverts come in just after. And the idea is if you know how to model this stuff, you can really extract quite a lot out of, out of this data. So what sort of thing could you sort of hope to do? Well, a very, very typical open problem that's uh, advertised in this, uh, in this reference here is uh, this idea of network intrusion. Right. So what happens, and this is, a, this is a risk that's relevant to essentially any large corporation, is that someone on the network at some point is going to get um, compromised, right? usually by phishing emails. It seems sort of obvious, but that's the most obvious. That's the most common threat. And the point then is, well, okay, well, the, the attacker here has just sort of arrived at a random place on the network, right? And so probably not where he or she eventually wants to be. And so in order to get from that place to somewhere interesting where there's data, maybe nuclear secrets in this instance, um, the attacker has to hop around, right? And presumably when you are at work doing your normal research, that's not what you're doing, right? So you'd hope somehow to be able to spot this pattern of behavior in the data and sort of flag it up as anomalous. And the main problem, the reason why it's not easy is basically data scales, right? So in relatively medium-sized research organizations like Los Alamos or Imperial College, you've, you've got multiple terabytes of data to 
of the sort I've just shown to sort of trawl through. And so you can start to imagine the false positive rates you've got to be reaching here is very difficult. <coughs> trillions and trillions and trillions of hypotheses are being tested. Um, but yeah, this is, the, this is the basic aim, to somehow be able to model this data in order to be able to spot anomalies that are indicative of hostile activity. Okay, so there are various sorts of analyses that you can bring to bear on this problem. I'm going to skip over them. Um, to focus on the most recent problem I've been looking at, which is the raw modeling of the network, the raw modeling of a graph. So you're looking at the same graph again. Uh, so one minute basically on the left and uh, five minutes on the right. And you can see that the thing is exploding. It's becoming quite a large graph quite quickly. After 10 minutes, I can't plot the thing anymore. And the basic idea or something you'd like to do is be able to look at this graph and say, OK, well, um, is, there, is there an edge here that doesn't belong? Is there, is there a connection that isn't, isn't consistent with the rest of the graph? Right? That's what modeling could help you do. And so if you were to approach this problem just looking at the sort of currently available sort of highly cited literature, you, you might fall upon a tutorial on spectral clustering, which has over 3,000 citations. Uh, you might come across Newman's modularity paper, 4,000 apparently citations. And they're, they're basically um, approaches that are looking to cluster a graph. Right? And what does clustering a graph mean? Well, in, to use their words, it's to somehow find groupings of the nodes whereby the connectivity within the group is much higher than between groups. Right. And this is the, the idea that's been um, exploited both in the spectral clustering uh, literature and this modularity idea where, where essentially all that's happening is the degree has been corrected. But there's a degree correction on top of it. And so this is a simple thing you could try, but uh, there's also a very simple diagnosis test that you could do on this data that will make you immediately realize that this stuff is completely irrelevant. Right? And so uh, I can count either in the first graph or the second graph, even the big one, and there isn't a single triangle in those graphs. Right? Not, there isn't a single time where node A has connected to B, B to C, and C to A. And if you're looking for clustering in the sense I just described, this should be really alarming. Right? Because if I'm similar to you and you're similar to him, then he should be similar to me. And therefore, in a large enough graph, we should start seeing triangles if, if similarity implies propensity for an edge. Right. And so basically, a slightly more sophisticated approach is needed. So looking more into the you know, very purely statistical literature, there's a very popular uh, distance-based model by Hoff, um, which takes this form. Uh, and then also a, 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 more recent, uh, a re more recent model where essentially, in well, in both cases, what you have is um, for every, every node needs to be assigned a latent position somewhere in some d-dimensional space. And then the probability of an edge between two nodes is going to be a function of the two latent positions. Right? And what you make that function defines basically the difference between these two approaches. But focusing, for example, on the first one, you can see, well, OK, well, if it's distance, right, well, the most important property of a distance is that it satisfies a triangle inequality. And you can easily realize that if you're latent embedding satisfies the triangle inequality, then you're going to have triangles in your graph. So there's something not right about either of these models. So what's basically going on? Well, the property, the, I, I choose to call it disassortivity. Basically, it's this idea that things that are similar in computer networks tend to actually not be likely to communicate. Right? And there is. Well, three reasons. One very, very strong. Uh, number three is the second strongest, and number two is a, just something I fancy, basically. Uh, so the first point is that a lot of a lot of computer networks are, um, are generally sort of cyber-related networks, are often organized in client and server models where clients connect to servers. 
right? So if you color all the clients blue and you color all the servers red, then you're only ever going to get connections between blues and reds. So you can never get, to get a triangle, you'd have to have either two reds or two blues connecting. Point number three is a collection. So whenever you're looking at this data, you've got to realize you're not really looking at the real computer traffic. You're actually looking at how the, um, how the traffic has been collected. Or sorry, you, the, you have an observation model on top. And where, what's happening basically is you have routers that are sort of placed in different positions. And if, and if you've got sort of internal traffic going on in one sort of sub part of the network where there are no routers, then that traffic won't sort of appear. So you'll sort of always get data going from one place to another, and so you have this disassortative effect. Okay, and the, the last point is, okay, you're, you're looking at computer networks here. And computers aren't like people, right? People like to chat, right? Whereas like computers, you know, a printer doesn't need to chat to another printer, right? A printer knows how to print itself, right? So, so each node has its own sort of function, and it's not really going to need to make connections with other nodes of the same function. So all of these properties together create an effect where similarity in the sort of intuitive sense actually implies the opposite of a connection. And I call that disassortivity. So to try to model this and um, basically all sorts of other graphs that are appearing in cybersecurity applications, we need to take a, a slightly more abstract step. And uh, start, we'll start with... Uh, well, one of the most famous theorems in Bayesian inference. So I'm sure loads of people here know I've seen this before, and maybe some people haven't. So if I've got an infinite exchangeable sequence of binary variables, what that means is, uh, so each, each variable can only take value 0 or 1. Um, it's infinite. And exchangeable means that the probability of observing any sequence is not changed if I apply a permutation to the sequence. Right, so the order doesn't matter. Well, Di Finetti famously proved that it must be the case so the XIs are conditionally independent given a success, a fixed, sorry, given a random but fixed throughout success probability P. So basically what I can, I can imagine, or the, the example I like to give is I can imagine this sort of a, like a box of coins, right? And each coin has a different bias. But all, I, all I'm going to do is I'm going to pick one coin, and then from forevermore, it's just going to be that coin that I'm tossing. All right. So independent, conditional on the coin I picked, the probability of getting a heads. And just before I move on, because it will be relevant later, there are, there are at least two ways of misunderstanding this theorem. Right. And the, how did I say it? at least two? Sorry, there's one way that, that is um, a very common misunderstanding of this theorem, which is to somehow forget the word infinite. It's perfectly possible to have finite exchangeable sequences that don't have definitive representation. And you'll, and you'll see an example happening in, in later. Uh, the most uh, easy example is to imagine uh, just a sequence of length two, where the first one is heads or tails of 50% probability, and the second one is whatever the first one wasn't. Right? So it's exchangeable. The probability of observing heads and then tails is the same as tails and then heads. But clearly, there's no way I can t toss the same coin independently and, and get that probabilistic sequence. So the reason I'm bringing this up is that, as you might be able to imagine, there is a similar theorem that applies for graphs. And the reason you might be able to imagine this is because a graph is just an adjacency matrix, right? It's a, it's a large matrix where, in position ij, I put a 1 if i and j have connected, or in 0 otherwise. So instead of having a binary sequence, I have a binary graph, a uh, binary matrix. Well, it turns out that Aldous and Hoover independently in 1980s, I think, um, proved a representation that has a very similar flavor to Definetti's representation. And it's probably easiest to just show you the construction. You start with a function h here, which, which has the same interpretation as a coin that I sort of picked out. Right, so that's going, to be, that's going to be my function. It's going to be on the unit square and returns a probability, a number between 0 and 1. And that function is fixed throughout. Okay, and here I've imagined that this function, by some luck, has turned out to be uh, a block structure. So that, for example, uh, what am I calling it? H. So H of 0 0.2, 0 0.3 is equal to 0 0.9. And this function is symmetric. Then for each node, I'm going to draw a uniform random variable independently between 0 and 1. And finally, each edge is then just going to be constructed 
as a binary variable with probability given by the function value at the two uniform random variables. So for example, the probability of an edge between um, nodes 1 and uh, node 4, I, I just have to look up, uh, look up the function. It's not 0.9, so the probability that nodes 1 and 4 have, a, have an edge is not 0.9. And uh, indeed, the edge is there. Now, this very fancy picture is just trying to illustrate that obviously I can, uh, I can approximate any smooth structure with a block structure by just adding enough blocks, right? So this previous model where I said, oh, I was lucky I got a block structure, well, really, actually, this is a full model, right? Because I, put, I can put enough blocks such that any smooth um, H, I'll call H a graph, and can be approximated. And this motivates uh, a model which has been, uh, has been proposed uh, completely independently of this Aldous Hoover uh, theorem, uh, which is universal in the sense that it can approximate certainly any infinite exchangeable graph given enough blocks. And if you're Bayesian, you can, uh, you can put down the marginal likelihood, you can put down a prior, and you have a very explicit formula, the probability of a graph given the clustering uh, that you can try to maximize or sample from or whatever. And we developed uh, a bespoke algorithm to try to get posterior samples from this model, and somehow trying to exploit the sparsity of the graphs that we see. And as you can see, it does something reasonable. So basically, if, you, if you've lost me somewhere, then colors indicate, well, two nodes of the same color if they have similar connectivity patterns, if, you, if they're clustered together. And before I move on, there's just a couple of pictures here that are showing that it, essentially things are all right. So, so one, there's other data here, for example, there's uh, ports. And ports tell me something about the behavior that's actually going on in the edge. So if I split all of the data by um, cluster pairs and work out the contingency table of the ports being used, then if I've, if I've extracted something from the, from the graph, then hopefully I'll be, be able to predict the ports a bit better. And we do. The contingency table has a Pearson chi-square of, well, zero basically up to simulation error. Um, a different point, and the, the reason I sort of started looking at slightly more sophisticated things is, um, OK, because we're Bayesian, we have, a, we have a sort of quite a nice way of being able to check our models. And they basically involve taking a posterior sample and regenerating data according to that posterior sample. So if you look at the, if you look at the middle column, what you have is the original graph colored by different posterior samples of what the clustering is. And on the left and right, you have replicates. So if you look at the topmost row, you see there's a gigantic problem, right? Which is like all and tons of singletons appear in the simulations, whereas they don't in the real in the real data. And that is just a very exciting bug. Because um, it turns out of maybe obviously I don't know that when you when you look at the data, you're only shown edges. So by definition, if you make all the nodes from those edges, then you're gonna find that every node has degree at least one. Right, and the model doesn't know that. So, whereas the data, every node has to have at least one connection, and um, in the simulations, it doesn't. So, in the rows underneath, I remove these effects. And the problem is, is that you still see some discrepancies. You, um, in particular, um, you look at these flower shapes here, and you find that they're. Oh, this is. Right, my pictures have changed. <laughs> okay, let's look at the middle row. Uh, if you look at those flowers, then you'll find they've completely disintegrated on the sides. And so I don't exactly know why, why that is, but there is at least two possibilities. The first one is that this infinite exchangeability assumption is basically wrong. I mean, we know it's wrong. It's a finite graph. And th that means that conditional independence is not necessarily going to be there. And um, indeed, it's perfectly conceivable that when I connect somewhere, that makes me not want to connect somewhere else. And so that's one of the things that could be going on. And the other one is, well, OK, when there's a penalty right, for 
uh, modeling something as a block structure, even though it can approximate a perfectly smooth structure, which is you haven't encoded any of the smoothness assumptions. So as I add more and more blocks, my prior, unless I'm clever somehow of how I'm sort of, what the heights of the blocks should be depending on how close they are, then I haven't really encoded some of my assumptions. And you can actually do formal tests of these things and you can definitely certainly reject the stochastic block model in this data. How am I doing for time? You've got about 10 minutes. Oh, great. So the other thing I should have said is that these uh, posterior sampling, sorry, these Monte Carlo routines that I've described, they take overnight for like 100 nodes, right? And we'd like to be able to talk about 10,000, 100,000, a million nodes, right? Uh, and it scales roughly as a cube in the number of nodes. So obviously, if it takes overnight on, on 100, there's absolutely no chance. Uh, but this could go much higher. Uh, so that's one problem. The other problem is the, thing, the, the model sort of discrepancies are described. And basically, we're going to try to reformulate the model in order to try to solve some of these problems. And the idea is, OK, this graph on this H is trying to do something quite complicated, right? You've, got, you've just got these uniform numbers for the nodes, and you've got this function H, which is a very difficult structure. I didn't say that, for example, it's only identifiable up to measure-preserving transformations, and there's all sorts of stuff about it that make it quite an intractable object. Um, so the idea is, OK, well, why don't we make the kernel very simple, and instead of assigning to each node a uniform random number, we'll actually give it a proper latent position in D dimensions. Okay, so that gives me quite a lot of freedom on how on the function I'm going to choose to to given two latent positions, what the probability of error connection should be. So I'm gonna, as I pro I'm going to propose that a nice way to do it and a, and a good way to interpret latent, latent positions in general would be to say, if I'm in the middle of A and B, then my behavior should somehow be a mixture of a behavior of A and B. Right? And to be specific, for every interaction I'm going to make, I'm going to flip a coin, 50-50 in this case, because I'm in the middle. Uh, and if it comes heads, then for this interaction, I'll behave like A. And if it comes tails, then for this interaction, I'll behave like B. And I would like this property to be preserved for all convex combination of nodes across the latent space. Well, it's not a very difficult uh, thing to prove, but there's only one choice for the kernel if you want this to be true. And it basically, well, the only one family of choices. And basically, it means that f has to be a, bilinear, a symmetric bilinear form. And because we're talking finite dimensional stuff, five minutes ago, because we're talking finite dimensional stuff, then that basically means that the probability of an edge between x and y has to be x times a matrix times y. X transpose times a matrix times y. So that's nice. We've like kind of made um, the search piece a bit simpler. And as I don't have much time, I'll simply mention that a very, very popular model called a mixed membership stochastic plot model is actually just a special case of this. So, in the mixed membership stochastic block model, all I, all I have to do is look at the region, imagine it's a convex polytope, and then point, nodes are just going to be these convex combinations of these of, uh, vertices of a polytope. But it turns out that this model, because it's got an obviously very similar structure to the eigen decomposition, is actually a very simple thing to estimate. Um, what we have to do is take the original adjacency matrix, Work out its eigen decomposition. Sounds hard if the uh, adjacency matrix has got like 10,000 entries, but actually, this is totally doable. Um, pick out the dominant eigenvectors, stick them together, scale them according to the eigenvalues, and we have a consistent estimate of this model. Consistent means as I make uh, the graph infinitely large, I will identify the parameters ex exactly. And the really beautiful thing about this is that um, for literally something like 50 years, there's been active research on trying to do singular value decompositions and eigen decompositions at scale. And nowadays, 
I mean, this stuff goes like lightning. You can do you can do two hundred thousand uh, a matrix as long as it's sparse. Uh, a two hundred thousand by two hundred thousand matrix. It's just ten minutes work, right? Um, and then very recently, um, there's also been theory proving central limit theorems about the actual identified latent positions in the graph. Um, so we can talk about the uncertainty of our, of our identification of various positions. And so I, I, something that I find kind of cool, if you were trying to do dynamic graph analysis, then one of the stupidest things you might suggest would be to, oh, I'll, I'll do an eigen decomposition, I'll get latent positions for time t equals one, and then I'll do the same for time t equals two and three, and then I'll fit a Kalman filter, right? And it's the sort of thing an idiot would say because none of this should make sense, right? But actually, it totally would, right? You've got, you've got Gaussian observation error, uh, you just need to change the Kalman filter just a little bit, and you have a, you have a model for a dynamic graph. So I guess it's maybe one or zero. Or yeah. one. <laughs> um, so on to very quickly purely disassortative networks. Right? So these are the networks that uh, basically you hate yourself and you love other people. Right? But if you've got an extreme case where you've got three clusters and basically the clusters A, B, and C, and people in A never talk to A, and people in B never talk to B, and C never talk to C, but they all talk to each other. Right, then this is how this is how the positions would look. Um, so what we have is a is a space. It's not Euclidean. It's a pseudo Euclidean. Um, it has a signature one Q, um, and this implies identifiability patterns. In particular, you're allowed to rotate in in the sort of uh, horizontal dimension, but you're only allowed Lorenz, But you're also allowed Lorentz boosts in the um, what they call Lorentz boosts in the um, y direction. And in general, basically, these networks have exactly the same latent space structure as space time in special relativity. So all the, all the concepts of special relativity, the, the idea of a speed of light, um, et cetera, um, they're all basically relevant to modeling disassortative networks. Um, and I could give an example, but I don't think I have time. Just to conclude, uh, I won't talk too much about this slide then. Uh, if you actually apply this stuff on real data and you look at link prediction as a problem, and the reason why you might want to do link prediction is because if you can predict links well, you can also predict when links shouldn't have happened for anomaly detection. If you just apply very simple corrections to cope with this disassortativity, then uh, you get really quite massively improved estimation results. So, so this stuff is useful. Thank you. <laughs>